Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and very welcome to the Swedish Institute for European Policy Studies, CIEPS. My name is Göran von Sydow and I'm the director of the Institute. And I'm very happy to welcome a small but highly qualified crowd here as participants in this seminar and equally happy to welcome you following this event online. Today's seminar has the title The Rule of Law, the European Court of Justice and the Future of the EU. And we do think that these three things, they can indeed go together, as the rule of law is one of the fundamental values of the European Union, the European Court of Justice being one of the principal institutions in our union, and indeed the way in which we deal with these matters will have profound impact on the future of the European Union. At CIEPS we have followed issues concerning the rule of law for a number of years, and I do think that we will continue to do so over the next couple of years too. We've done that by analyzing the toolkits that the European Union have at its disposal and the institutional responses given by the various EU institutions. In this project, one of the latest contributions is a quite substantial report, which has the title Respect for the Rule of Law in the Case Law of the European Court of Justice. It's actually the longest report ever produced by CIEPS. And I'm really happy to welcome the two authors here today, Professors Laurent Pesch and Dimitri Koshinov. Laurent is from Middlesex University in London and Dimitri is from Central European University in Vienna and Budapest. And you will soon hear the presentation of their main findings and also the main conclusions they draw in this rich material. There will be a discussion as well here among the participants and also with comments given. But before that, I'm equally happy to have here today Sweden's Minister for EU Affairs, reappointed recently, Mr. Hans Dahlgren. As we all know, Sweden is very concerned when it comes to the rule of law and the fundamental values of the European Union. And we are very happy then to welcome you here to give an introductory speech in this seminar outlining the government's position on these matters. Welcome, Hans. Thank you very much, Joran, uh, and thank you for the invitation to participate here uh, this morning. Uh, CIEPS is uh, one of, uh, I think, several hundred agencies that we have in the Swedish governmental system. But there is only one that is directly under the Prime Minister's office and the Minister for EU Affairs, and that is CIEPS, the one and only. And therefore I'm very, very keen to keep in good touch with this institute. And the subject that you are dealing with today is of great interest to me, I must say, the respect for the rule of law. And it's a very timely, of course, since uh, only yesterday we had the, the decision by the Advocate General to um, dismiss the actions brought by Hungary and uh, Poland uh, against the regime of conditionality that was such an important part of the uh, budget agreement uh, last year, as you know. And this, uh, in my mind, paves the way for, for the use of an entirely new instrument in our protection of the rule of law. Can I be a little personal to start with? I'm soon into my fourth year as Minister for EU Affairs in the Swedish Cabinet. And I must say what I have found during these years to be one of the, of the greatest strengths of the European Union, that is our firm commitment to this fundamental set of values, democracy freedom, uh, equality, and of course, the rule of law, all explained very clearly and distinctly in Article 2. And they are, of course, the, the very foundations on which our democratic societies are built. And they are, they are not exclusively European values, but they are definitely the values of the European Union. And this is why a discussion like the one that you will have today is, is so needed. Sadly, of course, in Europe today, we, we need not only discuss the issue of rule of law, we need actually also to defend it. And defense is needed because uh, European democratic values, including the rule of law, are under threat. I've spent a good part of the last year, a few years, visiting a number of high schools all over this country. And I can tell you one of the most frequent questions that I get when I meet students in high schools or, or universities is this, why don't you do more in the EU to deal with these obvious breaches against fundamental values that we see in other parts of Europe? And in a way, of course, this is uh, encouraging because 
a lot of people, a lot of young people obviously care about common values, but should also be a signal to us as politicians that uh, we need to do more to do whatever we can to strengthen this respect for the rule of law. And of course, it is never acceptable that any member state retreats from the commitments that they made very clearly the day that they entered the Union. The Union, as, as you all know, back in the 50s was created as an antidote to authoritarian tendencies. And that's why democracy and the rule of law and other fundamental rights are so enshrined in Article 2 of the treaty. But regrettably, in several member states, we have seen that these foundations are being eroded. We see attempts to make judges more dependent on politicians. We see attempts to control the content of media. We see threats against journalists. Uh, and as this audience knows better than most, the rule of law is supposed to hinder wrongful exercise of power, a prerequisite, of course, for a mutual trust in society. But also, an independent and impartial judiciary is extremely important for the internal market, the single market, to function well, for economic transactions to flow freely, and for a trust also in the economic systems that we have in our 27 member states. And I think this link is extremely important, more important than ever perhaps now with the huge amount of money that is going to flow from the, from the recovery plan that is now being, uh, the plans that are now being uh, approved for member state after member state. This is not free money. This is money that in the end will be coming from our taxpayers. And I think they certainly expect very clearly, to, they expect us to make sure that there is full control over how these funds are being dispersed. I must say there are also some good news in this field. It was a very positive signal, I think, uh, some time ago when the Court of Justice ordered Poland to pay a fine of 1 million euro a day, as long as they did not obey the court's decision to close down the infamous disciplinary chamber. And I hope this will make our Polish friends understand that the EU institutions do take this very seriously. And of course, I'm very glad that we have established by January 1st, for the first time in our union, the legal mechanism that provides a link between the rule of law and the payment of funds from the EU, confirmed yesterday by the Advocate General. And as you have seen, the Commission has recently sent letters to both Poland and Hungary as a first step toward triggering this new conditionality mechanism. It is my, my view that the Commission has to continue to show its clear determination to take action here in this field. But the Commission can't do this all alone. It's also a joint responsibility for others to be engaged defending the rule of law. And this requires a, a resilient democracy, of course, an active uh, civil society. It also requires free and independent media. And this, these are things that we have to remain vigilant about. And I guess all of us, the institutions of the EU and their agencies, we in the member states, including the regions, the judiciary, of course, national parliaments, civil society, must all work together in this direction. Because the goal is very simple. We must make sure that every European citizen can live in a society where the rights and values of the Charter of the European Union prevails. So that's what I think is a point of departure for a discussion on the rule of law. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much, uh, Hans Dahlgren, Minister for EU Affairs, for these introductory remarks. And uh, I'm sure that there are elements that was brought up here that we will continue also further on in the discussion. Now I'm going to hand over to today's moderator. Annika Strömelin is a well-known journalist, author and also member of CIEB's advisory board. Over to you, Annika. Thank you so much, Joran. I'm really looking forward to this, to moderate this seminar. 
uh, about this very interesting report. I read it. I find it extremely interesting. And the seminar will proceed as follows. First, the researchers, Laurent Pesch, Dmitry Koshnev, will present their analysis of some key judgments from the European Court of Justice concerning the respect for the rule of law. And I think they also briefly will highlight, highlight the developments since the publication of the report. Is that, is that correct? Perfect. And after your presentation, I will be very happy to welcome Jane Reichel, who is professor in administrative law here in Stockholm at Stockholm University. Um, yes, you will comment this report. And then I will open the floor for the audience. Um, and as Jöran said, we are really happy that this small group of, of Swedish judges, law scholars and other experts with an interest in European affairs have come here today to listen and take park, part in the discussion that you have struggled through snow and ice to be here with us uh, today. And we hope we will have an interesting, uh, lively discussion and we will close the seminar at 11.30. Uh, so let's begin. <laughs> Please, uh, Laurent Pesch, Dimitri Kochenov, the floor is yours. Uh, Laurent, you, you're going to start. Yes. Thank you very much, Annika, and uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, <coughs> let me begin by just uh, offering some thanks to the SIPS team, not only, first of all, for their patience, because we delivered the report, I'm afraid, just uh, about uh, 12 to 14 months later than the first submission date. But you know what they say about submission dates, you have always to miss the first one, otherwise you don't look serious scholar. Um, and uh, thank you also for the amazing support in terms of editorial feedback we have received. In fact, it was just immensely helpful. Uh, special thanks to Patricia as well. Uh, she's been very patient with us uh, in terms of uh, proofreading and updating footnotes and so on and so forth. Uh, so my thanks to the SIPS uh, team and my thanks also for organizing uh, this seminar this uh, morning. Now, it's always a moment of a kind of a joy and a feeling of achievement and pride. And once you have finally overcome the writing process and you see the product you've been writing on for so long out and available free of charge online. But it's also actually in a way depressing that we had to write the report to begin with. Um, respect for the rule of law was never supposed to be challenged in the EU. In fact, a part of the enlargement process was to make sure that if you join the EU, in fact, your commitment to the rule of law, democracy and respect for human rights was on a sustainable basis, irreversible basis. Sadly, I'm afraid, um, we have been uh, witnessing in the EU per what I have described uh, with Dimitri as rule of law backsliding, but you can call it uh, democratic and rule of law backsliding because rule of law backsliding always leads to also backsliding when it comes to democracy and respect for human rights. Uh, just uh, last month, uh, uh, the president of the Court of Justice for the very first time publicly and exceptionally mentioned that the survival of the EU legal order is at stake. Can you just pause for a minute and reflect on this statement by a sitting president speaking extrajudicially, telling us the survival of the EU legal order is at stake. That's what happens, I'm afraid, when you let the process of democratic and rule of law backsliding goes unabated unchallenged for so many years. From my point of view, rule of law backsliding began in 2010, so this is nothing new. Exhibit A being Orban's Hungary. So the rule of law democratic backsliding started in 2010. Exhibit B is Poland since the end of 2015. Uh, fast forwarding to 2021, Hungary is no longer a democracy, which is why the US government did not invite Hungary to the summit of democracies happening pretty soon. And from my point of view, uh, Poland is on track to becoming the EU's second authoritarian member state uh, within the next 12 to 24 months. In a way, from a rule of law point of view, I, I would argue uh, that uh, Poland has gone further than Hungary. Uh, uh, there is no longer any meaningful separation of powers in Poland. The independence of judiciary has been completely successfully dismantled. There is no such thing as an independent judiciary anymore. Uh, we have only some pocket of resistance uh, thanks to brave judges and brave prosecutors and brave lawyers fighting against the flow. 
uh, the minister was referring to this uh, great ECJ recent order imposing a daily penalty payment of 1 million euro per day. Uh, however, I must emphasize the fact that uh, Polish authorities no longer recognize the validity of any ECJ order or any ECJ judgment relating to judicial independence. They just they have made compliance with judgments of the Court of Justice unconstitutional. So just uh, it's it's just un so unthinkable that uh, people are still not understanding fully the consequence of what has been happening in Poland. They're now doing the same with the ECHR right to a fair trial. They're essentially legalizing lawlessness. Lawlessness is now the norm in Poland, not the exception, and people are still in denial about it. I mean, people, I mean, key EU actors. In Hungary, it's been a bit different. They've been able to undermine judicial independence, but in a more subtle way, by just taking capture of the top uh, Supreme and Constitutional Courts, leaving the rest of the system relatively autonomous. But the end process is that Hungary uh, was described as the EU's first authoritarian member state since 2019. So the EU is no longer a union of democracies. It's just a fiction to argue. Uh, that it is. Now, in this context, essentially, the Court of Justice finally uh, stepped in into the fray uh, mid uh, July, uh, mid summer 2017. Our report, uh, technically, the, the key starting point is not 2017 but 2018, uh, the so-called Portuguese judges' ruling. But we decided to make an exception to our uh, uh, subtitle by also including this uh, interim order of the ECJ from July, uh, from November 2017. Why? Because it's, it was a clear first signal to Polish authorities especially that you cannot be a member of the EU and just comply à la carte with ECJ orders and rulings. So, and this was the first time a daily penalty payment of 100,000 euro was threatened, not enforced. But the one million daily penalty payment actually is only is the third instance where the ECJ actually discussed or threatened and then imposed daily penalty payments. To date, Polish authorities were in 2017 were threatened with a daily penalty payment of 100,000 euro per day should they refuse to comply with a previous ECJ order regarding uh, Polish forest, so it's an environmental matter. But it was the first time in 2017 that in the history of the EU, an ECG order was explicitly uh, disobeyed by public authorities. Polish authority, in the end, pretended to comply. In fact, they didn't comply, which is why, in fact, there is a, uh, an Article 260 infringement action pending against Polish authority regarding the same case. So then, since then, uh, Polish authorities have had to pay 500,000 euros per day in a, uh, in a case relating to uh, the closure or non-closure of a mine at the border between the Czech Republic and Poland. And then this 1 million uh, daily penalty payments is the latest penalty payment. So currently, Polish authorities uh, are, have to essentially, uh, non-compliance with the rule of law is costing them 1.5 million euro per day. But since they don't recognize the authority of the ECJ and uh, the validity of the ECJ orders for them, they don't have to pay because they don't exist. They've gone further recently to the extent that they've done the same with a, a ruling of the ECHR, which they have declared non-existent. So the situation is really dire. I cannot overemphasize the gravity of the situation when just remember what the ECJ president has just stated. The survival of the EU legal order is at stake and is completely right. We have an EU legal system which is a very interconnected one. We cannot have pockets of autocracy in a mutual trust-based legal mechanism. It doesn't work. Uh, so either there yeah, are two options. Either we confront the challenges or we deny the challenges. And currently, I'm afraid it's a bit of both, uh, depending on who you're talking to. So it's, it's in this context uh, that the report uh, came into being. It took, it took us a long time, but to, I'm going to defend the slow nature of a writing process uh, just very briefly. But just to give you an idea of uh, how complicated uh, the amount of the, how voluminous the case law has become. When, we start, when I started working on the rule of law with Dimitri many years ago, we had a couple of judgments, but nothing really that dr dramatic on uh, judicial independence. Uh, the key judgment of the Court of Justice was the Wilson judgment, but it was really about uh, tiny uh, non-compliance with access to the profession of lawyers uh, in Luxembourg. So nothing really uh, to write home about. Now, uh, since, the, since uh, Poland's rule of law breakdown began in 2015, now we've, we have a total, I calculated last week, 
Uh, if you include ECHR rulings, we have four of them dealing with rule of law breakdown in Poland. We have a total of 22 judgments and orders from ECJ and the Strasbourg Court dealing with uh, rule of law breakdown in uh, just Poland. So 22 judgments and orders just regarding Poland. And I'm not including the judgments which are indirectly shaped by this situation. Just in the case of Poland, pending, we have more than 50 uh, preliminary uh, rulings. Uh, uh, only 13 have been decided. So a lot more uh, preliminary rulings to be decided. And the ECHR is getting increasingly uh, suffocated uh, by what's happening in Poland. Uh, the ECHR is a bit more difficult to get exact data regarding the ECHR. Um, but uh, according to the press office of the ECHR, they have a total of 57 uh, individual complaints raising different uh, violations regarding the rule of law situation in Poland. And currently, four judgments have been uh, issued by the ECHR. Our report does not directly tackle the, the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, first of all, because it's more recent. Uh, but uh, addition to, I think we have no choice uh, but to integrate uh, the case law of the ECHR a bit uh, more to the extent that something new is happening, something good actually. at the way the disciplinary chamber has been tackled by both courts. This is exactly what we want to do, just raising different violations of rule of law requirements and reinforcing one another, the scope of EU law being more limited than the scope of the ECHR. Uh, you can raise violations of ECHR in any national dispute. Um, now, th the problem, obviously, is that we're facing a structural non-compliance in the case of Poland. But uh, just to bring uh, back to uh, the, uh, my presentation and conclude uh, uh, very quickly, we have decided to focus on the case law of the Court of Justice, uh, mostly on cases directly connected to rule of law breakdown uh, uh, in Poland. And, but before that, essentially, we had also to uh, discuss the, the broader judgments, such as the Portuguese judge, judge's ruling, the Maltese judge's ruling, and the Romanian judge's ruling. So a lot has been happening, uh, if I had to summarize. The Court of Justice, in the space of three years, has offered all the legal ammunition the Commission needs to actually initiate infringement actions. The problem, I've told you, we have 50 preliminary ruling requests raising rule of law issues, about 57 ECHR applications raising rule of law issues in relation just to Poland, only a total of four infringement actions uh, since 2015, all about the situation in Poland. Um, sadly, that's not even close to be enough. Uh, I would say we need just more infringement actions and we need more sanctions. The situation will get worse. The silver lining is that uh, there's going to be a need for edition number two of this report, I guess, uh, by uh, next year. It's going to be increasingly uh, challenging uh, to actually keep on top of the case law because we're expecting, I would say, about uh, another 10 judgments most likely in the next uh, tw 12 months. And uh, as uh, was mentioned uh, also at the start of this discussion, we have a new kid uh, in the block, uh, the EU rule of law conditionality regulation, which we all expect to see finally activated in the next uh, six months. Um, but then most likely, uh, then there's going to be more legal challenges if uh, suspension of EU funding is ordered uh, by the Commission and then approved by the Council. So essentially, this is uh, going to get worse, I'm afraid, before it gets better. Uh, as far as Poland is concerned, I would say the situation now has reached a point of no return. Uh, we are talking about the structural systemic violation of all the requirements relating to a right to a fair trial, including the requirement to have your case heard by a court established by law. So it cannot be worse than this. We have about uh, 100,000 judgments which may have been issued in Poland by unlawfully appointed uh, individuals. What are we going to do uh, with all of these judgments? Uh, and then, obviously, because we are in an interconnected legal system, anything which happens in the member state uh, is infecting uh, the rest of the system through the existence of mutual trust and mutual recognition-based mechanisms. So I didn't want to depress you uh, too much, but I'm afraid uh, 
uh, the situation is not going to get uh, better anytime soon in the short term. And uh, if, we, if we have learned anything through this uh, writing of this report is that uh, the law might not be the solution, but uh, we certainly need uh, more infringement cases to contain uh, the problem. I'm not saying that uh, legal actions and financial sanctions are going to sort it out, but we have to make sure that the situation doesn't get worse. And then I think there is room for improvement. But uh, overall, and then uh, I'm going to pass the, the, the floor to Dimitri, or uh, back to Annika, rather. Um, and um, I would say the Court of Justice overall has done an excellent job. There's been there's some... Um, areas where the Court of Justice could have done better, could have acted more decisively, but uh, these uh, gaps in the existing uh, case law are going to be uh, mentioned by Dimitri. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Laurent. And before I pass on the word to you, Dimitri, I have just one question, maybe in detail, but you highlighted the fact that this um, sort of enhanced constitutionalism that you describe this load of new rulings and one of the starting point was this Portuguese judges case. So I, I was a bit curious because when I read um, the facts about this case, I mean that that was uh, that regarded measures um, against um, uh, reduction measures from government uh, to tribunal judges. Mm -hmm. And in the end, the European Court of Justice said that this, this was not a violation. So I was just curious, what is your explanation to the fact that this case became sort of a starting point for, for this uh, development? Yes. So the Portuguese judge's case came uh, just a few months after the first open defiance uh, from police authority regarding an ECJ order, uh, which they refused to comply with, leading to... Uh, uh, the court saying, if you don't comply, 100,000 uh, euros per day for the very first time on the basis of an interim order. Uh, the, this uh, Portuguese judge's uh, case um, is very interesting. Many aspects of it are very interesting, uh, which is why, in fact, this is the first chapter of, uh, of the, the book, essentially. Uh, what the Court of Justice has done is, in fact, what Dimitri and myself and Professor Chepelet argue the court should do a few years before, uh, which is to uh, activate uh, the principle of effective judicial protection, which is to be found in Article 19, Paragraph 1 of the TEU, which is a Lisbon Treaty addition. Because this provision is not uh, limited by the, the same way the rest of EU law is limited by, which is normally EU Charter, for instance, only applies or can only be relied upon when a national authority acts within the scope of EU law. The Court of Justice uh, gave a much broader scope of application to the principle of effective judicial protection. Essentially, any national court uh, which may apply EU law must uh, be protected, essentially. And anyone whose, uh, whose uh, rights relating to the principle of effective judicial protection have been uh, undermined or violated, including judges themselves, can actually sue their own member states to defend their own independence. I'm talking about judges. And the outcome of the case was not surprising. It was in the context of an austerity uh, environment where civil servants in Portugal were subject to pay cuts. And uh, some judges argued that uh, they were special to that extent that they were judges and should not be subject to pay cut. This argument was rightly dismissed. But I think uh, what, they put, what the Portuguese uh, Association of uh, Judges did was less to fight about this, but just to give uh, the Court of Justice finally the first opportunity to actually activate uh, this uh, Article 19, Paragraph 1 to you, which should have been activated before by the Commission. But uh, well, what we've seen is the Commission is always in a reactive mode. They wait for the Court of Justice to answer preliminary ruling questions, and then they're going to make use of whatever legal answers provided by the court. Uh, but then that means, uh, in the case of Poland, that essentially the Commission is waiting for Polish judges to commit professional suicide. Then we get answers to their questions, and then uh, we can have more enforcement. But the Portuguese judge's ruling, essentially, from my point of view, and perhaps Dimitri has a... Uh, I mean, he would agree, but... Uh, um, most likely, we'll see. Uh, but uh, from my point of view, what's uh, interesting, I compare this uh, Portuguese judge's ruling to a US Supreme Court ruling from the 1920s, which uh, expanded the scope of application of the US Federal Bill of Rights to any state authority. So from my point of view, all things be equal. What the Court of Justice did is a bit 
kind of the equivalent to what the U.S. Supreme Court did when he expanded the scope of application of the U.S. Bill of Rights. The Court of Justice, however, has done this only as regards the principle of effective judicial protection. So you can argue that he was, in fact, the right answer at the right time. This has led, in fact, has allowed Polish judges and other national judges to refer plenty of judicial independence related questions. So Portuguese judges uh, ruling is really key. You can add to this uh, uh, pantheon, you can add now the Maltese judges ruling and uh, the Romanian judges ruling. Uh, the, the, the Maltese judges ruling has added uh, another uh, legal ammunition to the arsenal, the principle of non-regression. So essentially the commission has yet to do that, but the commission can certainly uh, bring an infringement action in the case, uh, in the situation where a national uh, uh, where a, a country, national authorities, uh, backslide uh, from a judicial point, independence point of view. So, for instance, for me, there is an easy case to be made regarding the Polish National Council of Judiciary uh, under the principle of non-regression, because they have regressed. They have made it less uh, independent than before. So that's a clear-cut uh, infringement case. The Romanian judge's ruling is also quite uh, fundamental, which is uh, from a May to 2021, yeah, uh, I'm getting old, too many cases. Uh, uh, this one is very important. I mean, it's a bit specific because Romania is under this uh, specific cooperation and verification mechanism. So he has to comply with explicit uh, rule of law benchmarks unlike uh, all the member states, that's so Bulgaria, Romania. But what's interesting about uh, the Romanian judge's ruling is that for the very first time, the Court of Justice has brought uh, together the situation of judges and prosecutors. Um, which is key, because if you want to undermine democracy and the rule of law in a country, you don't simply attack judges. First, you capture the prosecutor's office, which you can then use to bully uh, uh, reluctant judges into submission, and then also use to undermine the rest of the system and also prevent, uh, for instance, corruption investigations being launched against you, if you are the government. And then this Ro Romanian judge's ruling, uh, the Court of Justice has brought together very nicely, compellingly, uh, Article 19, Paragraph 1 of the TU, but also the EU Charter, and apply both uh, to the regime, disciplinary regime relating to uh, judges and prosecutors. So really, the Court of Justice has done the work. And now said the, the Court of Justice, however, can only answer questions or can only you know, deal with cases uh, reaching uh, the court itself. Uh, so it's for the Commission and uh, national governments uh, to step up uh, to the challenge. Uh, currently, uh, the, both the Commission and the Council have failed miserably uh, from my point of view, and uh, which is why I think uh, out of despair, the President of the Court of Justice kind of uh, uh, had to state something very bluntly, survival of the EU project is at stake. He spoke also in the same speech of red lines, which if they are crossed, essentially the EU legal system does not exist because mutual trust cannot exist in a system where these red lines are crossed and left unsanctioned. He didn't mention any country, but we all know obviously uh, who he had in mind. Uh, and sadly, uh, uh, the, what I call the authoritarian gangrene is just spreading. We've been talking, I mean, I've been talking about uh, Poland and Hungary, but uh, we should also pay attention to Romania, where the Romanian Constitutional Court has just point blank uh, violated uh, the uh, Romanian judge's ruling of the Court of Justice. So where is the infringement action in this case? This is a, a straightforward violation of the ECJ ruling, and they do so on the basis of the rule of law. So that's another good example of uh, gaslighting. Uh, when autocrats violate the rule of law, they tell you that they do that in the name of the rule of law. So that's very uh, typical uh, rhetoric uh, from those undermining the rule of law. But uh, sadly, I'm afraid, either we do something about it or this is going to spread to the rest of the system. And then uh, EU taxpayers, like the minister uh, was uh, saying at the start of this uh, debate, are going to start asking questions. Why should I keep, as a taxpayer, why should I keep subsidizing the establishment or the consolidation cost of uh, what is essentially a soft dictatorship? So uh, existential questions have to be asked uh, at this stage, I'm afraid. Thank you, Laurent. Um, Dimitri, now the floor is yours. And to continue right where Laurent left it, in fact, and to, to put it probably more bluntly, the commission has been undermining the rule of law by inaction. So you can, uh, you, you can commit, commit an, uh, an act of, violation, of violating the rule of law also through doing too little. And in this sense, plenty of the victories that the Commission uh, reported to us, plenty of press releases about compliance, say nothing positive about the rule of law. 
And as, as one illustration, two weeks ago, Commissioner Reinders came to, to, to my institute in Budapest, with which Laurent is also affiliated, and he, and he told us, we won the CU case, uh, what do you think about the rule of law, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it's excellent, but CU is gone to Austria simply because the commission didn't act fast, and it could have, uh, it, it could have, won, it could have won it on different, on different grounds, and also using an expedited procedure, which was never, which was never requested. So as a result, the, the victory is there, and they can report on the victory, but the institution is not, is not in the country, de facto, teaching, for CEU in Hungary is, is, uh, is against the law. And it's, it's the only university in the European Union that had to leave a member state going to a different member state simply because of the pressure, uh, the enormous pressure that was, that was put on the institution. So this is, a, this is a great illustration among dozens and dozens, I'm afraid, and this is exactly the problem with the current system, uh, where winning cases doesn't actually help you to win the battle. Be, and, that's, and that's exactly where the Portuguese judges uh, is probably a, a ray of hope, because uh, winning, winning the case is actually not important for the parties. So what happened to the Portuguese judges ultimately in the long run is, 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 of, no, is of no relevance to us. What is of relevance to us is, is the establishment of principle. And in this sense, the Court of Justice has been remarkably consistent in carefully building this uh, this overwhelmingly convincing, I would say, line of case law that we try to describe in the report. This avalanche of cases uh, adding bit by bit uh, to, this, uh, to, to the whole picture, to, the, uh, to, to a new presentation of what, what the rule of law is about in the European Union uh, has been vitally important in also, as Laurent said, uh, showing the Commission the way of what could be done. And in this sense, of course, the Commission has not been, uh, has not been sufficiently uh, proactive in, in listening to the hints that come from Luxembourg and then in, 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 in bringing more infringements and doing it, uh, doing it in a sufficiently time, timely manner. But all in all, I wanted to be more positive, in fact, uh, than Laurent is. So, so what I want to talk about is a mad uh, positive story. Uh, which, which goes against the, the assumptions that the EU is built on. So the assumption is the EU is a union of democracies uh, which all uh, comply with the rule of law, which all love human rights, which genuinely embrace the ideals on which the Council of Europe stands as well. And this is not anymore the case. So we need to start thinking about how to reinvent the union then in order to make sure that we either keep on embracing this ideal in fact and in practice, or we simply say we are probably ASEAN, we are probably something else, we are an organization that doesn't care, <coughs> in essence, about the values of Article 2. And this kind of dilemma is, is the dilemma that the Union faces for the first time in its history. We, we should be absolutely clear about it. So, so all the case law that the report describes is fundamentally innovative precisely because this kind of challenge has never arisen before. Because the member states actually did comply with all these ideals, because, uh, because actually Article 2 was simply a summary of what was in place in any case at the national level. And now, for the first time, the, the union is emerging as a true constitutional system. And that's, and that's the positive story. Because a true constitutional system is a system that stands for its values in fact that doesn't simply proclaim the, the desiderata and, uh, and, then, and then keep on re keeps on repeating them, but actually can, can step in and enforce uh, what the system is about. So, uh, so if we think about Germany, we think about dignity. If, if we think about France, we think about laicite, plenty of other things. And those are the principles, the, the principles that actually guide the systems. With the EU, uh, the core values, the core principles of Article 2 were rather proclamations they were not really, they were not really the, the substantive guiding stars of, of what the EU is about. And now for the first time since the Portuguese uh, judges ruling on, the Court of Justice opened the doors for the Union to emerge as a, as a substantively value-based system, something that uh, makes it more similar uh, and brings it closer to what we have at the, at the national level. In this sense, this is, a, this is an overwhelming positive step uh, for the European Union. And I said mad because if, if, we, if we look at the literature about uh, what could be the core dangers for the European Union from the 90s and from, from the beginning of the century, uh, there is a lot about mutual assured destruction. 
Because if we speak about EU law, we speak about dialogue between the courts. Uh, so the, the authors like Weiler, authors like Kuhn, uh, leading professors uh, engaging with this, with this topic, they saw danger in national courts uh, failing to comply or failing to, to yield uh, on some occasions to what the Court of Justice uh, is, is trying to tell them. And that was seen as the main danger because the assumption about, the, about adherence to the values was, was so, so, in, so ingrained that it was presumed to hold. And now we see a much madder story because instead of a dialogue between courts, we have dressed up gentlemen in Poland and also the, 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 the lady, the, especially the president, of course, who pretend to be a court. And we know that they are not uh, under, under what uh, the, the European Court of uh, Human Rights tells, that, tells us. We know they are not. Once we, once we read as minimally educated lawyers, the Polish constitution, and we know that the politicization of the system is such that it would be, it would be an offense outright to claim that there is any kind of judicial dialogue possible between those people and the court of justice. So instead of, instead of failures of mutual understanding, we have a crumbling of, of the national system that is, uh, that, that, is, that is the true problem. And then this is definitely not something the union was uh, initially designed to address. So all the current case law is about, is about bridging the gaps between what the assumptions were about the values and, what, uh, and, and, and how bad the situation is in practice. So this, this bridging of this gap is, is fundamentally important. And once again, this allows the union to emerge as a true constitutional system. And so if we, if we build all the line of cases from Portuguese judges, say to Maltese judges, it's a, it's, 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 it's a, remarkable, it's, it's a remarkable lightning strike uh, by the Court of Justice, because first it established its own authority over the substance of the rule of law for the first time. Because if, if you remember the starting point of the rule of law in the European Union, that's Liver judgment, where essentially the court says we are a rule of law community because everything that we do is based on law. It's not good enough in order to address our current problems. So obviously it had to be upgraded. Why is it not good enough? Because uh, Prime Minister Orban has done everything in accordance with the law. And what Professor Shapley called that is it's, it's a legal coup. You can have a constitutional coup. You can destroy the rule of law by legal means. So, but if, if you are elegant, if you are non-elegant, like, uh, like those who are trying to destroy Poland, then you can simply ignore the law and pretend that you're a judge and pretend that you stand for some kind of values while at the same time ruling that Article 6 cannot bind, uh, cannot bind uh, the Polish state and is uh, potentially against the Polish constitution. In this sense, of course, the situation that we're facing is, is quite remarkable because even Azerbaijani courts, even the courts of the Russian Federation, the Turkish courts, are formally in compliance with Article 6. It's only one member state of the European Union that happens to be below the Azerbaijani, Turkish, and Russian standards, something that the founders of the Union definitely uh, couldn't possibly envisage. And then the Court of Justice said, OK, given the situation, and no matter what the outcome of the case is, uh, we established the principle that we can look at these matters. That's the, that's the Portuguese judges. Then they moved on from there saying, actually, we can, also, we can also use expedited procedures and we can also enforce it by way of not only imposing some kind of fines, fines are fine, but also by way of requesting the full restitution in terms of how the system is designed. Because if you simply ask for fines without asking for the, for the illegally retired or unlawfully dismissed judges uh, to be returned, then it's unlikely that you will be able to, uh, to rebuild the system uh, back to the level, uh, to repair the system back to the level uh, from which the, the crumbling of it has started. And then, of course, the, main, the core problem of all, this, of all this case law is that it presumes some kind of dialogue with the member state. It presumes that the Poles, the Hungarians, whoever else, where the problem lies, is actually listening and taking you seriously. And here we have, uh, we have a breakdown in communication. Because when, when, when the Polish uh, fake court 
or kangaroo court, as, uh, as Professor Pesh uh, calls that, actually quoting uh, uh, old-style United States case law. It's not just an animal. We have, uh, we have full respect for the kangaroo. Uh, but the kangaroo court, and here no respect for, for, the, for the fake court, uh, tells us that Article 19 together with, with all the fundamental, uh, fundamental provisions about the values in the, in, the, in, in, in the European treaties, do not actually apply to Poland because they are against the Polish constitution. And in this, and in this case, broadening the scope, bro broadening the focus of the substantive definition of the rule of law was key for the Court of Justice. You cannot do, you cannot do much by simply saying that you cannot dismiss the judges. And that's why prosecutors is the next step, as, as, uh, as, as Laurent has already mentioned. But we need a much broader understanding of what the substance of the values of Article 2 actually is. Because we need to look at the media authorities, we need to, pre we need to make sure that uh, ombudspersons are not harassed. We need to make sure that, there is, uh, the, 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 that the dictatorship is, is slower, at least slower emerging. And, and in this sense, the Maltese, uh, the, the Maltese judge's ruling is key, because this, uh, this non-regression principle that the court has formulated, sitting as a grand chamber, is, uh, is, uh, it's, it's a very solid approach, I think, uh, to defining the scope of the law as, uh, and the scope of compliance with, with basic values as they stood at the moment of the accession of those countries to the European Union. So the court says you cannot backslide under that minimal threshold that was reached on, on, the, on the particular date when you, became, when you became members. And this means that it's not Article 19 anymore. So the, the, the Maltese judges, uh, the, the, the case makes a connection to, to Article 19, of course, and also to the Charter, but, but it's not Article 19 anymore. So the Commission can take any field now. It can take up any issue. And this is what, uh, what uh, uh, everybody's expecting from those guys. It's their job to start using all the legal arsenal at their disposal in order to move against the, the corruption, the rot, uh, at the core of what the union is about. This union is not like ASEAN. This union is a union of values. This is what makes us different from, from Eurasian Union that the Russians built with Belarus. This is what makes us different from, from plenty of other unions which, uh, which, are, uh, which are built on different core principles. And uh, I think I will leave it here. But uh, the, the final point is, is an optimistic one. Uh, the horrors of the awakening to the idea that simply being a member state of the European Union doesn't actually prevent you from, from backsliding into autocracy uh, is something that pushed the institutions of the Union, especially the court, uh, in order to rethink and rebuild the system in such a way that the substance of the system uh, now matters much more. Uh, so I, I, sh I actually look at the future with optimism, because the, because the case law shows clear direction, and now it's up to it's up to the commission uh, to start delivering. So all eyes on the commission, as it were. Thank you so much, Dimitri. I just one question for you. Also, um, I wonder if you can help me to understand the reasoning of the court when it comes to Article 19, because you, as you have both focused on, it's, it's Article 2 with the values highlighted by, by our Minister of EU Affairs and Article 19 that is the key for this new law case. Um, and if you read Article 19, I mean, it's not evident, at least not for me, that this is, <laughs> uh, this is what it means. I mean, and, and I quote, Member states shall provide remedies sufficient to ensure effective legal protection in the field covered by union law. I mean, can you explain a bit further how the court's reasoning in this respect has evolved and how they can connect this with Article 2? Not too long, though, because then we have to leave the floor to, to Jane. Question. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> that will be extremely brief. Uh, the article doesn't require any kind, of, uh, any kind of particularly deep thinking. It simply assumes that the member states, A, have courts, and B, those courts are minimally working. So under this article... Well, even Azerbaijan was, would pass, even the courts of, of, of the Russian Federation would be okay, but not the Polish fake courts. So, and this is the, this is the lowest denominator. And why, why is that important? 
It's, it's because the union is based on mutual recognition. So when, when the Polish judge decides something, a Dutch judge, an Estonian judge, a Portuguese judge should be able to trust that decision. The same applies to all the decisions of all the authorities, actually. And why Article 19 is important in, in our context and in connection to Article 2 is simply because the Court of Justice needed, needed the hook in the treaties, as it were, to, to hang the substance of values on. Uh, it's not the Court of Justice that invented this reading of Article 19, of course. So beyond the, 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 the objective value of the text that you need to respect Article 6, uh, basic due process of law should be available. Uh, in connecting that to, to, uh, to, to, to the scope of the law, we had doctrinal writings from 1990s, which everybody laughed at, more or less, or l rather left unused. Uh, Professor Asher wrote about, uh, about the potential of inter-court cooperation in order to broaden the scope of the substantive understanding of values. It's 1996. Judge Kakouris wrote about the same. And then the, 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 general res the, the general response from the academics was, well, but why is that important at all? There are courts, they function, the, 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 the national level is working fine, so the assumption that all the member states comply with the basic values uh, should not be actually policed in substance. And now we find ourselves in the situation where we look back at those 1990s writings and we suddenly realize actually the late Professor Usher was right. The, it does make sense uh, to, 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 to have this, uh, uh, this doctrinal understanding. Dimitri Kochnov and Laurent Pesch for giving us so much food for thought and discussion, I hope. But now, please, Jane Reichel, welcome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you much, very much for this opportunity to comment on this very interesting uh, report. And uh, also after uh, being able to listen to your very interesting presentation. And uh, I, I would like to take a bit of a different uh, standpoint here. I, I very much agree to what you what you have been presenting uh, and discussing in regards to uh, the autocratic and, and the soft dictatorships. Uh, and, and I think this is uh, something that, that the EU must take very much seriously. And uh, as it is also questions the, the, the foundation and, and the, the future existence of, of EU. Uh, but still, <laughs> even though I fully agree with you on this point, I would still like to argue that this case law uh, should be seen uh, in a bit more limited manner, and I will uh, I will explain uh, why. Um, uh, the, the, my question here is: What would it mean uh, if the the understanding and, and the function of rule of law, as is uh, developed here in in the case law that you presented and and how as you have discussed it, what would it mean if this understanding and function would actually be part of the constitutional understanding and the constitutional setting of the EU uh, as a total to vis-a-vis to, -vis all the member states. Uh, and, and, and the question is, could the constitutional setting and understanding of, of the EU constitutional order uh, be based on experience by these soft dictatorships? And how do we understand the rule of law in this context? Uh, uh, as you have at m several times also uh, underlined that the mutual trust, the mutual recognition is a very important part of, of the EU uh, illegal order. And could we, could we actually abandon that? I'm, I'm not suggesting you, that you said that, but if, you, if one would expand and, and see wh where this case look could lead to, uh, I'm a bit afraid that, that we're giving a bit too much to the Court of Justice and, and which might undermine the, the, the very delicate balance between the constitutional order in, in the EU. And, and I would like to, to take as my point of departure this, uh, which you also discussed in your report, uh, uh, what the Court of Court of Justice says in the um, Portuguese judges' case where they define the rule of law uh, in in the EU, and they, and there is one sentence there that, that that where they say that effective judicial review designed to ensure compliance with EU law is the essence of the rule of law, meaning that that uh, the essence of rule of law is to ensure compliance with EU law, and. 
And you also say that this uh, in your report that this is sort of a, I think you call it a, a mundane objective, uh, the, the to ensure the compliance with EU law is, is can be seen to a too mundane an objective to to be called the essence of the rule of law. So I think we agree on that. But I, I would like to, if one would take this this line seriously and and sort of see what would that mean. Um, where, where, where would that lead us? And then, of course, obviously, we would have to, to go back a bit to what is the EU, and we're not, we don't have to go through uh, all the decades here, but, but from Van Gendern Laws and Costa versus NL and everything. Ha and and it, it has the member states actually uh, conferred on the Court of Justice to be the final arbiter of the EU legal order? In, in its entirety. Um, I'm not so sure. I think there is a balance here, there's a cooperation, there, there is a dialogue, but I'm not sure we could finally says, say that we have, the, the Court of Justice ha is the, the emperor of it all. And uh, so what I would like to, to do here is to, uh, to, to raise two points. Um, one is on, uh, from, from the background of, of this understanding of the rule of law and what it could entail. Uh, and the, one, the first is, is what, what it means, uh, independence of court. Uh, is this only, are the national courts only to be independent vis-a-vis -vis the national go uh, government and the na national political structure? Or uh, could they also actually be a, a bit independent, independent also towards the EU? <laughs> uh, could that be included? Or is, is this constitutional, defining of the constitutional setting uh, of the EU only a matter for the Court of Justice? And, and the other point I would like to raise is this uh, principle of non-regression that you, that you also presented. Uh, and uh, and is this also something that is only a matter for the court of justice? And here, perhaps I'm not uh, thinking so much about the national courts, but perhaps the, the legislator, the lawmaker. Who is the lawmaker here? Is, can it, is it only the court of justice? Um, and can we have a rule of law system that allows itself to be self-referential in this manner, that it's only the court that could define this. And what is the role of the EU legislator and, and also the, the national legislators, of, of course? So I would like to start with the first point, uh, um, the role of the national courts and setting the limits of the EU legislative competence or, or defining the limits and the protection of fundamental rights. And we've, as we've, uh, uh, we just seen this was from, from the Van Gendern Laws and Costa Personnel and their whole development with the Solange case and everything. And, and where, are, where are we now? And I would like to say, to say that we, it's the question, the jury is still out. <laughs> we, we haven't really settled this is, issue. And, and we've had over the years, all the time, uh, constitutional courts, Supreme Courts, uh, high courts to, to, to not fully accept uh, the, the full uh, supremacy of EU law. And, and I think this is something that, that has also always been in, in the cards. Uh, th there is something there. There's a dialogue between the courts and, there, there's an, and it's not fully decided who is, is, is to, to, to say, have the final word here. And, and, but I think in the light of this, this development that we could perhaps see that, that we're going into to a stricter uh, more EU uh, enforcement model. And I was thinking especially on the uh, German Constitutional Court in the PSPP case uh, that came uh, rather recently. Um, and where, as you probably all know, where the, the, um, the German Constitutional Court found that the a ruling of the ECJ uh, was contrary to, to their understanding of, of, of the treaties and, and that the, the EU legislator had acted beyond their competence uh, within a spe specific uh, on the, and I have to admit, I, this is not my area of law. I hardly understand it, the budgetary rules and and, uh, and how, you, the, how within the eurozone. And, uh, so I'm not. I, I am not going to do, say anything about who is right in this in the, in the substantive law uh, issue. But I think just the constitutional question: who who, uh, um, who has the final say? 
Um, and here the, the, the commission has launched an infringement proceeding against Germany because of what uh, the EU constitutional court has, uh, the, the verdict they came with. And I'm not so sure this is a good development. Uh, uh, I, I, to have this, if, uh, but if, if we want to dis define uh, the rule of law as the, the, the Court of Justice did in the, in the Portuguese judge's case, that the essence of the rule of law is the effective review designed to ensure compliance with EU law, well then, of, of course, this, this follows from, the, from this. But I, I would say that it also undermines this definition and this understanding of the rule of law also undermines uh, the, the whole function of the preliminary ruling system and, and the dialogue between courts and, 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 the, and the mutual trust and, and mutual recognition of the courts uh, to de together develop EU law. And I think it's we might be losing something by, by going too hard uh, and, and, and letting the Court of Justice have all the, the, the final says. Um, and it's, it is an imp important part of the constitutional setting of the EU uh, to have this constitutional dialogue between courts. And, and in this case, I just wanted to, uh, I, I, I was reading the uh, Venice Commission uh, for Democracy Through Law, uh, their uh, rule of law checklist uh, that came in 2016. And they have one point, uh, it's, uh, it's a long checklist, but one of the points is that uh, they, they do recognize that, that uh, a full domestic implementation of international is crucial. Uh, there's, I, there's no questioning of that for my part uh, either. But, however, it does, does not mean, says the Venice Commission, that it, it should always have supremacy of the constitution or, or ordinary legislation of, of the national states. So I think I, I would agree here with the Venice uh, <laughs> Commission that there is, uh, there is a small, but it should always not always perhaps, but th there should be some some limits to what what what, what the the international organization can d decide um, to the very very end. And and you in your report, uh, um, um, you you conclude in your conclusion and the final parts of of, of your report, you say that uh, that the the Court of Justice should educate in concert uh, with the European Court of Human Rights, mu mutually reinforcing the lines in case law. And I, I fully agree to this. I think that would be very good. And perhaps I would put into that a promise of some sort of restraint from the Court of Justice, not to turn the doctrine of a rule of law into a simple principle of constitutional efficiency and, and, and compliance mechanism. And I hope I have still some time. I'll, I'll continue with my second point on, on the, the non-regression principle and the role of responsibility of the, le uh, of the legislator uh, in a, a legal system based on the rule of law. And here, um, uh, as you presented, the, the non-regression principle, uh, uh, having included into it, it I don't think... As, and, and you didn't say so that, that the Court of Justice today has turned the Article 2 into this sort of uh, um, foundation that could all, always be reviewed in the member states. But there is in the Maltese case, uh, Maltese judge's case, sort of a opening towards that end. And, and, and also here, I think that, that this is some, a matter that should be treated with some delicacy. Um, because the, the, the non-regression pr principle would then um, s state that no member state would be allowed to fall below Arti uh, Article 49, which, which includes uh, a promise to keep with the, the values of the, the union, which are listed in Article 2. So the values are respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, rule of law, respect for human rights, uh, and so forth. So these, these are very important uh, values that, that I think we, we, all, we all find it tremendously important, but they are not always so easy to define exactly what they mean. And they have a different, they, ca they can have um, different meaning in different contexts. And uh, the question is obviously here for, for me, can we allow the Court of Justice to, to single-handedly define this? And we were uh, to take it an uh, example from the Swedish uh, constitutional tradition that we were discussing before, that transparency is something that's very important in Sweden, and, and we could benefit from that, uh, and the EU could benefit from that. But it, 
it also entails some problems vis-a-vis <laughs> -vis the, the uh, well-known GDPR and, and the right of data protection. So there are parts of Swedish law that I, if, if, if they were under the review of Court of Justice, I think I'm quite sure that the Court of Justice would find them to be in, in uh, non-compliance. And this is a very delicate constitutional situation, and the, the Swedish legislator has um, bit by bit, uh, step by step, uh, and there is an ongoing procedure. We, we the the parliament and the the government just put a, a bill to the parliament to change the, our our constitutional text, uh, but this could only be done after an election and. Before the previous election, the the, the parliament vote uh, uh, did not accept the the bill in its entirety. But there are certain parts, and now the government comes for a second time to have them approved after the upcoming elections. And this is a sensitive it's a, it's a sensitive area, and I'm not sure that that the, that the court of justice coming uh, to say that we Sweden needs to do this now. I'm not sure it would be, would be so helpful. It, I think and there are cases where a dialogue is better, and and so what, and and so first, I think it would perhaps sometimes be problematic to let the court of justice have the full say. And one other um, um, problem that I, I I would see that it it would actually mean that the court of justice competence to to hear cases would be very much expanded because many of the the, the issues that are under Article Two are not fully. Uh, under the competence of the court, uh, of the EU to, to regulate. Uh, so it would mean that the Court of Justice would have a much wider com competence to, to adjudicate, adjudic adjudicate cases than the EU legislator would have to regulate the basic uh, components of democracy, uh, how to, to elections, uh, uh, transparency, ac accountability, uh, data protection, we know that's that's in the competence of the EU, but but uh, not transparency in all its aspects. So this would also be put us in a situation that would be a bit uh, uh, strange, perhaps, and, and, and not, not consistent. And, it, um, and another point, which is perhaps not so legal, uh, but would be that I'm not in quite entirely sure that the principle of regression always would be is a suitable tool to achieve the rule of law and this comes back to what i just said about the swedish transparency principle and and how these are delicate issues and it's not always th that uh, a verdict from a court can produce and build democracy from 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 the bottom and this was also something that you recognize in your report so uh, and we also need to for the legislator to be part of this pr procedure and and this is something also that you recognize in your, your report. That one of the blind spots that you identify in, in, the, in the last chapter is the inconsistency of the application of EU law uh, between different sectors. And I think this is, this is very true. And, and, uh, and this is a problem in EU law, uh, that, that the sector-specific areas differ a lot also with, the, uh, with uh, uh, areas of the, that the comes in, 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 comply, in the question and compliance of the rule of law. But, th but here it's also, I think that here's the EU legislator needs to step up here. And we, b being an administrative lawyer, uh, I, the rule of law and, and, and the protection of fundamental rights often come in, into play in the administrative uh, nitty gritty parts. And we, we see here with uh, the European arrest warrant, which is not uh, administrative, but, but, and, but uh, the framework program of the euro system and the financial market law and, and many of these areas, we need to have a better legislation in the bottom to be able to 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 have this uh, a prerequisite for for actually having the rule of law. So um, there is a risk, I think, if we we, we put, put too much emphasis on this non-regression principle that the the rule of law and the idea of supremacy. Uh, Will, will lead to an exercise of public power that will actually undermine the, the rule of law, the, the law in itself if the law is poorly drafted. So we need to have good legislation for the rule of law actually to function. That's an important part. So to conclude, <laughs> uh, I would say that the survival of the EU law uh, legal order cannot simply be a question for the Court of Justice and, and uh, 
and uh, we need to have a, a, a full co collaboration and respect, constitutional respect for the parties and we cannot adopt uh, the EU constitutional uh, setting only from the experience of, of, of soft dictatorships. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Jane, for also broadening the discussion to the role of the Court of Justice within the European Union. That is, of course, of, of core value in this discussion, too. And I will give you the opportunity to answer. But I would also like to <clears throat> tell you, the audience, that you have the opportunity to comment or questions if you like to take part in the discussion. Please raise your hand and I'll give you, I'll give you the floor. And uh, w we will also hand over a microphone to you because, as you know, this uh, seminar is being recorded and broadcasted in this moment. So please uh, raise your hand, take part in the discussion. And now, uh, Dimitri or Laurent, would you like to, to answer to what Jane, Jane has said? I mean, I'm not going to attempt to answer all of the points. It's just, it just wouldn't be possible within the, the allocated time. I think you've, you've been you're talking about a different issue than the one we've been trying to confront. Uh, so you're talking you've broadened the debate to uh, the role of the Court of Justice and primacy of EU law. But uh, to my, uh, as far as Poland and Hungary are concerned, primacy of EU law is just a smoke screen. Uh, this is not the issue at all because in the case of Poland, they are now organizing the systemic violation of EU law, ECHR law, and the Polish constitution. So it's nothing to do with primacy of EU law as such. It has to do with rule of law versus autocracy and lawlessness. So to that extent, uh, the debate about the role of the Court of Justice is not really the key debate. Uh, <coughs> so uh, it's very important to emphasize that the Court of Justice is only trying to make sure that national authorities comply with their own national rule of law requirements. So the Court of Justice also is there to comply also, to make sure that compliance with the minimum requirements relating to EU membership are complied with. So there is, a, I have certainly no issue myself uh, with uh, the way the Court of Justice has stepped in reluct reluctantly. The Court of Justice cannot seize itself of cases, obviously, as, as you know. So uh, it only has to answer preliminary ruling questions, uh, infringement actions, annulment actions. So it's not about primacy of EU law. Obviously, Polish authorities, Hungarian authorities have been keen, for instance, to muddy the waters and include references to the PSPP uh, ruling and to say, well, if the Germans can do it, why not us? But this is not at all the case in the PSPP ruling, essentially, which is a breach of the treaties, to be clear. Uh, the German Constitutional Court uh, disagreed with a decision of the ECB and then uh, the interpretation of EU law by the Court of Justice. So, clear breach of the treaties. You could argue that uh, disagreements are always possible as long as disagreements take place between good faith factors. And this, in this case, you can say that constitutional pluralism, which you seem to be in favor of, can work and possibly correct. But here we're not talking about uh, good faith factors. We're not talking even about courts. So the comparison with PSPP ruling and the rulings of the constitutional court is is a nonsense from the start because the Polish Constitutional Tribunal is not a court. You cannot dialogue with non-court, non-real judges. So I think we need to be careful when we try to discuss the role of the Court of Justice, primacy and constitutional dialogue. I'm actually not against this kind of discussion, but what we are seeing is much more dramatic. We are seeing the systemic violation of European and national rule of law requirements with national authorities essentially setting aside any judgment they don't like anymore and punishing any critic they don't agree with or they want to bully and to submission. So we have to be careful. Uh, in a fair weather environment, I would say, we can certainly have, we can agree to disagree on primacy of EU law, role of the Court of Justice, but uh, that's not what's happening in the case of Hungary and Poland. We're already talking about lawlessness national judges suspended for just sending questions to the Court of Justice. Or, or can you have a dialogue between national judges and European judges when national judges themselves are punished for trying to enter into a dialogue? It shows the absurdity of the situation we find ourselves in. Same situation in Hungary with the most recent judgment of the Court of Justice on the attempt by Orban's fake Supreme Court to undermine the functioning of the preliminary ruling mechanism. So as you can see, in the case of Hungary and Poland, nothing to do with primacy of euro. It's just a kind of a smoke screen to hide essentially the transformation of uh, both constitutional systems into 
uh, autocratic uh, systems. In the case of Poland, actually in clear violation of their own national constitution. Hungary is a bit more complicated, uh, but that, that was my main reaction. Thank you for this <clears throat> fundamental point. And in fact, I agree with every single word you said. But I think it, uh, it's of no relevance to our report and, uh, and the discussion that we try to present. And uh, I agree to the, to the extent that I have published a number of papers uh, which, uh, which your talk could have summarized. Because it's vital to have, uh, to have clear limits and mutual, mutually respectful uh, dialogue between the courts in the, in the European Union. And in fact, uh, PSPP is probably not the most worrisome case in this respect. But one of the most worrisome, worrisome cases, to me at least, and I know Laurent will disagree, is Commission versus France, uh, where the Court of Justice said not sending a question to us is a violation of the rule of law if you are the highest court of the member state. And probably, actually, in, from the formal point of view, they're right, if you, if you read the treatise. But, uh, but in terms of allowing the freedom uh, to, to actually have a different opinion at the national level is not something that the Court of Justice has demonstrated in that case. But that case is, is really part of the fundamental discussion, which is of a different order, the one that you started, and it's extremely helpful to start. Uh, while what we were talking about uh, in the report is whether the Court of Justice should move against a member state that doesn't recognize Article 6 ECHR, a state that doesn't believe that, uh, that independent provision of justice and basic due process of law is something that should be guaranteed to all, the, to all those in front of its courts. And, that, and in this, at this level, and the threshold level is, is, the most, is the most important thing to distinguish what you were talking about and what we were talking about. At this level, when Article 6 suddenly is not law, as we heard from the Polish so-called constitution, constitutional so-called kangaroo court last week, is, 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 is exactly where I don't see any problem whatsoever with the Court of Justice intervening. And then the last point, uh, it's a scandal how the Court of Justice defined the rule of law in the Portuguese judges. There is no justification for that, for that narrow approach, but that narrow approach, of course, is taken by an actor, an actor of the EU legal order acting within the sphere of application of EU law, which means that for the Court of Justice, in that specific case, this approach could actually be fully justifiable. And in this sense, I do believe that and I, th I wonder whether Laurent would agree. I do believe that the courts should not always act as academics and, and list full definitions. They can also start with, with a minor point, which is of vital importance in the concrete context of the concrete case in front of them. And in this sense, uh, in, in, in the case of Portuguese judges, like in plenty of other cases in front of the Court of Justice, it's the, it's the, it's the functioning of EU law that actually bothers the Court of Justice because the Court of Justice is there precisely to make sure that EU law is observed. This is the function of the Court of Justice. And then the rule of law, as interpreted and enforced by the Court of Justice, should also be uh, rethought from the, uh, from the standpoint of this, of this vital function. So I think it's a scandal when taken out of context, but probably less of a scandal when, when put in the, in the general framework of how the dialogue works. Thank you, Jane. You will have the opportunity to answer later on. But first, please, let's listen to some comments or questions from, from the audience. Uh, uh, Eleanor will hand over to Joachim first uh, a microphone. And Joachim, please present yourself for the audience. Thank you. Uh, Joachim Nagelius, University of Örebro. So thank you very much for a very interesting report. Uh, you bring up so many interesting cases and there would be a lot to comment on. But in, I have a reflection about actually two cases that you don't mention uh, or don't focus on. Uh, because I made a reflection that the Court of Justice Justice's approach to rule of law and human rights seems to have changed a little bit during this rule of law crisis. If we compare, for instance, with the Maloney case from, from 2014 which, or 13, which is a bit uh, notorious, uh, or even the, the, the opinion on uh, the non-accession, as it were, to the European Convention of Human Rights, where the Court of Justice has a slightly different approach, more a little bit more restrictive to what we see today as fundamental rule of law values. Uh, um, 
um, and uh, my impression is that the rule of law itself has reconsidered uh, some of those values given the serious problems that we have seen in Hungary and Poland in recent years. Uh, a second short reflection uh, that you might comment on. Um, given the problems with dialogue, dialogue between the ECJ and national courts, and on the other hand, the Commission initiated this so-called early warning mechanism that was supposed to promote dialogue between the EU institutions and failing member states, so to speak. That seems to be more or less dead today. I would like to hear your opinion on that. Thank you. Let's listen to two more questions or comments, please. <coughs> and please introduce yourself. Thank you very much uh, for this interesting talk and the report, of course. Uh, my name is Anna Orgalska Hedlund. I did some research on this topic a few years ago here uh, at CIEPS, and I'm a practicing lawyer otherwise. Uh, but my question would be when I l stopped my research, uh, which was a couple of years ago, so I could uh, foresee the case law coming. And it's been uh, beyond my uh, expectation, uh, really, from both uh, the Strasbourg and the Luxembourg court. Uh, but at that point, uh, Article 7 was triggered, and um, uh, it, it was seen as a very political tool. Now, my question would be, uh, when we have this clarified case law situation today, would that... Uh, strengthen the Article 7 procedure, it would, it could uh, depoliticize that procedure somewhat. So I would like to hear your reflections on that. Thank you so much. I hope you note the questions because, <coughs> Will, Annika, you you'll also have the opportunity to comment or ask a question, please. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, my name is Annika weppling korsnik from European Commission's representation here in Stockholm. Uh, very interesting. Thank you very much for this uh, broad overview of the case laws, etc. And uh, uh, I don't have a specific question, just more a few comments. Um, also very much lining into to what was previously said because of, well, you, you mentioned now it's up to the Commission, that the Commission has to step up and, and that is probably true. I'm not at all questioning that, though I'm also reconnecting to what uh, the minister said that the commission will not be able to do this alone um, and also connecting a bit with uh, what you just uh, your question here that uh, I mean the commission has launched uh, the article 7 as you know um, and had held hearings etc and, and probably felt that this this political tool uh, had its limitation um, and then moving a bit more to the judicial uh, way by launching many more infringement procedures than, than uh, previously um, to kind of uh, have this, these two tracks, the, the judicial and the political. And so my question is, is very much maybe joining in, in the, the ones before, can these two uh, enforce each other so that you might even have a, a kind of way forward also in the Article 7 discussions? Because now, of course, as long as we have we have rather limited amount of member states who are actually as proactive as one must, must say Sweden is on, on these issues. There may be just a handful that actually drive these issues. And, and as long as we don't have that, I'm not even sure that the judicial path will work. So, so how do you see the kind of the, the, these two enforcing each other? Thank you. Laurent, what do you say with this? Enforce Article thank 7. You, thank you for giving me the floor so I can pick and choose the easy questions and leave the difficult questions for my two co-panelists. Uh, regarding the early warning mechanism, are you, uh, do you have in mind the pre-Article 7 uh, procedure, so which was used against Poland and then essentially never used uh, again? Uh, we wrote with Dimitri uh, an early article about this early warning mechanism and we made the early prediction that it wouldn't work uh, because it's a discursive uh, tool which, is as, which assumes that you're dealing with good faith actors. And again, let me emphasize this point, in the case of Hungary and Poland, you cannot have dialogue with people deliberately violating European law and national constitutional rule of law requirements. So a discursive tool is bound to fail when you're dealing with essentially backsliders. So this is why it didn't work. However, 
he had some added value. I think without this pre-Article 7 procedure, the Commission would have never dared actually triggering Article 7. So to some extent, actually, I'm not, so I'm, I've been critical of this pre-Article 7 framework because it does delay action, but the added value of it is that it does organize a formal process whereby you document uh, rule of law violations, which in turn is going to make the job of other courts easier. So there is some value in this rule of law opinions uh, recommendation by the Commission to the extent that it has made it easier to trigger uh, Article 7, Paragraph 1 later. So. Um, but it would seem that I don't expect pre-Article 7 framework to be ever used again because now we have uh, two new tools, the rule of law report, which applies to all EU member states, and we have the, this new rule of law conditionality regulation. Article 7, uh, an interesting question, a difficult question also. Um, um, I'm one of the few who think there is nothing wrong with Article 7. I think uh, there is, in fact, some added value in the triggering itself, again, for documentation purposes. And it has also had a dramatic impact on the European IRS warrant mechanism. Uh, findings uh, by the Commission in the Article 7 reason proposal, which is very good, actually. So I've been criticizing the Commission, but uh, the quality of the rule of law uh, Article 7 proposal by the Commission is excellent. It has been used by many national courts and by the European Court of Human Rights as well. So just remember that everything the documented in terms of rule of law violation by the EU and in particular the EU Commission can then lead to enforcement through national courts and the European Court of Human Rights. Article 7 is good, must be used and must not be terminated despite the criticism about the lack of effectiveness. There's nothing wrong with Article 7. There is a lot of wrong with the Council uh, do, doing its best to actually uh, minimize the effectiveness of the mechanism. Uh, who is preventing the organization of uh, Article 7 hearings now? The Slovenian presidency. It's not the Article 7 which is to blame for the lack of effectiveness of Article 7 proceedings. The Council has adopted always systematically uh, an interpretation of Article 7 which makes it as ineffective as possible. So if you want to know more, just type my name, Article 7, and you see uh, my views on the Council. They're not very positive. But Article 7 is actually good. It has to be maintained and should not be concluded because it does create some positive crystallization effects, according to me. Um, and then regarding the Commission, uh, an interesting point about the mutual reinforcing dynamics, essentially, between the tools. So from my point of view, I mean, Dimitri is the same, we're very critical because we have the guardian of the treaty, this new idea that it's a joint responsibility to enforce the rule of law, yes, it's nice, uh, but uh, whenever a, a national parliament or a national government is uh, suing or uh, tempted to sue, then the Commission does its best to prevent them from actually uh, enforcing uh, EU law. We had an example with the Dutch parliament telling the Dutch government uh, to bring a, an Article 259 enforcement action against Poland because the Commission was not doing enough on the disciplinary chamber. And the Commission was very critical of the Dutch parliament. But then you just said that it's a joint responsibility and then you complain when national authorities try to enforce EU law because the Commission, in fact, doesn't want this joint enforcement because then it is seen as delegitimizing the Commission as the main guardian of the treaties. And in, in fact, uh, this joint responsibility, I think, uh, is just to a large extent another smokescreen. Uh, so everyone's saying it's a joint responsibility, so therefore it's not my responsibility. And at the end of the day, everyone is waiting for someone else to actually enforce the law. No, that's not how it works. The treaties have been designed with only one guardian of the treaties in mind, and that is the Commission. National governments must do their part, but to the extent uh, that they have to play a part. But I think we are now in a situation where the Commission is waiting for the Council to give directions, and the Council is saying, well, that's not our job to enforce the rule of law, it's the Commission's job. And that was, in fact, the position of the European Council uh, president uh, when uh, there was some discussion about non-green lighting the recovery plan. And uh, some governments, like the Swedish government, said, we need to discuss what's happening in Poland. President of the European Council said, the European Council does not deal with rule of law issues. It's not our job. I mean, they just did six months before. They adopted unlawful conclusions to, uh, to essentially suspend the activation of the rule of law conditionality regulation. So even to conclude, sorry, I'm being very long. And I get a bit annoyed when, when <laughs> I see now this. Now you opened up a new discussion there. <laughs> when I see this non-enforcement and then all the excuses <laughs> we get uh, to justify this non-enforcement. But the European Council is, uh, and the Council, like I li as I like to say, is where the rule of law goes to die. And they are so hypocritical. Uh, the European Council in December 2020 uh, essentially unlawfully suspended uh, the application of the rule of law conditionality regulation. And the Commission went along. 
uh, and it was something we can be really deeply ashamed of. Uh, I understand the politics of it, I'm not saying it's easy, but from a legal point of view, what we saw was uh, more violations of the rule of law, but this time committed by European institutions in order to give more time to those violating EU rule of law requirements at home. So, not acceptable. Thank you, Laurent. That's really interesting. But time is ticking. <laughs> we have two more minutes. So I would suggest that Jane, Dimitri, first Jane, you have one minute to comment or conclude or say something <laughs> to wrap this discussion up. And then I give the the floor to you, Dimitri, for one minute. Yes. Oh, well, well, thank you very much. Yes. yes. And, and I, well, I, I do agree that the, 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 your report and what you're saying is very important vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the autocratic states. But I have a problem with, with having it as a general constitutional principle. And I think that in itself would undermine mine the rule of law. And, and, I, uh, and, and I think that, that the, the first case, the Portuguese judge's case, wasn't against Poland, obviously. So, uh, uh, so I, I think one should tread carefully in this area, and and I think what EU should do, uh, there are, of course, the, the political solution would be the best, but obviously that is difficult. But from a legal point of view, the EU EU law could be also be more robust on the secondary. Uh, legislation level uh, to include conditional mu mutual trust clauses, if I could call it that, in all the secondary law, in, in, in the European arrest warrants, in, in all the, the uh, financial areas where mutual trust is. I think that would be a better way than to having this more grand uh, constitutional arena, which uh, I'm not sure it will, will actually make it to the, to the end. Uh, I th and I, I think that I will stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Dimitri. Just a very quick response. Uh, this uh, conditional, uh, conditional mutual trust cannot work in the countries with, with deficient judiciaries and deficient uh, or captured institutions, which means that if that is allowed for, then uh, probably a larger number of the member states than, Hung than Hungary and Poland will actually not be participating in, 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 the, in, the, in the mutual functioning of EU law as we know it today. And the, the, the question that was left for me uh, is uh, what, what Joachim said. I think it's, it's fundamentally important. There is a constant evolution of the notion of the rule of law and what stands behind the rule of law. And here, uh, connecting the, the, the commentator with what Joachim said, uh, the, the, to open the, the last Pandora's box for today, uh, the, the question is whether the European Union would actually meet its own a new case law criteria regarding the rule of law? And my answer would be, well, unfortunately, no. Because, uh, because in the European Union, well, in in, in Europe, on the European continent, we have two legal systems which, or which principally oppose, it seems, the, the accession to the, European, uh, to, the, to, to the Council of Europe and, and uh, taking upon uh, themselves the obligations under the Convention, and that's the European Union and Belarus. So 213 is the Belarusization of European Union law, is the shame of, 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 the, of, the, of the Court of Justice. And then building on that shame, which is absolutely unacceptable, but they will have to deal with that later, it's absolutely not in compliance with their own case law, uh, building on that shame, this Belarusization uh, kind of logic, is what, hap what happens with the court itself. Like uh, what, what happened with, uh, with Advocate General Sharpston, how they reasoned uh, on, uh, on the, their own say on the limits of power of those who hold the power to say that they simply cannot review uh, the member states' actions when member states act openly unlawfully is not uh, is not the right answer uh, in accordance with the rule of law uh, textbook which they themselves are writing. So there are plenty of problems, but this report focuses on a very con concise and concrete corner, which is the most problematic one. That is the corner of Poland and, and Hungary, which is blunt violation of the most, basics, uh, the, the most basic uh, parts of the rule of law. Thank you so much, uh, Dimit Kochenev, and thank you, Laurent Pesch and Jane Reichel. I think you all have you know, deepened our understanding how crucial the principle of law is for not only the functioning of the European Union, but for the future of the European Union. And that is something that concerns us all. So thank you so much. And thank you for joining us for this seminar. And thank all viewers on the web who watched us. Thank you.